Avalokiteshvara would be an approximate American English pronunciation. Avalokiteshvara. The name combines the verbal prefix ava, down. Lokita, a past participle of the verb lok, to notice, behold, or observe, here used in the active sense, and finally Ishvara, lord, ruler, sovereign, or master, in accordance with Sandhi, which is Sanskrit rules of sound combination, A plus Ishvara becomes Esvara. Combined, all of the parts mean Lord who gazes down at the world. The word Loka, world, is absent from the name, but the phrase is implied through the phoneme Lok. Got that? Now, the legendary story that goes along with this name says that this entity inhabits a zone of sublime supernatural power somewhere beyond the physical world and yet at the same time completely permeates, completely and totally permeates the physical world. The Bodhisattva is described as having a thousand arms and at the end of each arm is a hand and in that hand is an eye. Now any time that a sentient being such as a human being faces a problem or a situation or needs guidance or protection or needs to know something in that moment, Avelokiteshvara extends its hand and the sentient being, looking through the eye in the hand, sees what it needs to see, what it needs to know, where it needs to go to be well and protected and to go on its proper way in the world. Such is the fairy tale that accompanies this particular entity from the field of Mahayana Buddhism. So much for the technicalities. Fear not. This unit does not present a tedious discourse on Buddhism sprinkled and spiced up with Sanskrit intimate terms. It's a straightforward riff on the Gayan Tantric practice of self-love. To get into it, I take a moment, or allow me a moment, if you would be so kind, to rummage through some of the rubble. For instance, look at this family album snapshot of the boy child taken to be the 14th in a line of lamas, whose presence in the world affords a channel for the emanation of a supernatural agency, the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. Actually, I'd prefer to say Avalokiteshvara. So, there it is. Have you ever seen that before? It's the enthronement photo taken on February 22nd, 1940 in Lhasa, Tibet of the 14th Dalai Lama. He was born Lamo Thundup on the 6th of July, 1935 in China. Now on day four of the current Tantra mother shift, this child turned 84 years old. Recently, in an interview with a leftist dupe, he caused a considerable stir by saying that if he reincarnates again, it will be as a hot woman. Not worth it unless she's hot, he said, laughing in his usual ingenuous manner. The family album is tattered and stained. 
The glue smells faintly like spoilt milk. Somewhere along the way, a distant cousin or someone else, perhaps a passing stranger headed for Bhutan, or the local arrow maker, penned a short note and clipped it with a hairpin to the torn page where the photo is mounted. It takes the form of a little poem. The Lament of the High-Born Lama If I retreat from human pain beneath a gilded roof, my heart does not reside at ease. My lonely and aloof demeanor goes unaffaced. No person for the proof. The neophytes cry in the yard, their garments rough, their logic full of rage at human stuff. My contemplations keep me mired in this bluff. There's not a woman to be found on the Patala's turf. The only woman I once loved has spilled away like surf. The mother of my own true mind hath left me in the lurch. Buddhists today believe that the 14th Dalai Lama uniquely incarnates an emanation of Vavelokiteshvara. I don't know if the Dalai Lama himself makes that claim. I might somewhere, sometime, recount a little anecdote about the dinner party I attended for the Dalai Lama in Santa Fe around 1990. Compassion Rendered In Planetary Tantra, you do not have to believe anything about any such emanations. The Devatas of the Shakti Cluster are discrete frequencies in the telluric field of the earth, period. They are as physically real as wind and water. Compare them to stations on an old-fashioned radio dial. You run through the stations by turning the dial. Each station features different content, for instance, Cuban music or classical music. The account of a sailing adventure in the Galapagos poems by Dylan Thomas. The frequency bands are specialized. They carry signature acoustics which can be identified by a name given to their source. Budevi, Shodashi, Kamala, Matangi. These names have to be assigned. The sources do not give them. All frequencies have feminine names due to all being emanations from the ground matrix of the earth, which itself is the dream body of the Aeon Sophia, a galactic divinity of female gender. Aeons are gendered. So are electromagnetic currents and plasmatic torrents, which are abundant in the universe. Now, in PT, Avelokiteshvara is Tantra Mother. But this is, is not a mere equation that identifies the two. It is a conversion. Tantra Mother is altogether more and beyond anything that Avelokiteshvara has been claimed to be. With the Terma of Gaia awakening, the wisdom goddess herself renders Avelokiteshvara into Tantra mother, as butter is rendered into ghee, fat into tallow. Any reference of body, speech, or mind that goes to Avelokiteshvara now shifts to Tantra mother, or if it does not, it veers into an impasse, a dead end. Consistent with the act of rendering accomplished by the Aeonic Mother, who emanates an aspect of her power through frequency 12, Tantra Mother, a.k.a. Vajrogini, a.k.a. Miss Piggy, 
you can respond with your own act of rendering. You first turn everything that you feel to which you attach the notion or the quality or the inner sensation of compassion or any emotion connected to any belief about it into self-love. You render all your compassion for anyone whatsoever individually and for humanity at large into self-love as butter is rendered into ghee, fat into tallow. Do it right now. As you undertake the rendering, bear this in mind. This act of conversion applies uniquely to your compassion for other human animals, not for non-human animals or any form of non-human life. You set aside and separate that compassion for so-called sentient beings other than human from what you consider to be the compassion you feel toward those fellow tads of all races and nations. As you would separate the white of an egg from its yolk. The yolk goes into self-love. The white of transparent albumen remains aside for all sentient non-human creatures. Feel it. Feel how it runs through your fingers like threads of a sticky fluid web. Such is the feel of the sticky, messy web of life in which the thread of your life is interwoven, intermeshed with the life of all your relations and of all sentient beings. Form is void and void is form. That's a quotation from the Heart Sutra, which consists of only those two lines, which can be combined into one line. This is no yoke. Desire is the measure of all compassion. So, are you with me? Are you getting this? What I say, like Ray Charles, are you getting what I say? Your hold on compassion for other human animals is like the clutch of your palm gathered around the yolk of an egg. Can you hold the yolk in place as you raise or lower your palm vertically to make the gesture of the teaching hand that contains the teaching eye? This is no joke. This exercise shows you the grasp you actually have on human compassion. It also teaches you that the looking down into yourself of self-love fosters the eye of instruction for imparting compassion to others. In any instance or setting where you can actually, authentically do so, not merely pretend to do so, not merely fake it, make-believe, which is all you know of compassion until you receive this instruction of Tantra Mother. The white of compassion retained for non-human creatures slips through your fingers and the yolk remains in your palm. Feel it in your palm, how it gathers there and can just barely be retained as you offer your hand in the mudra of teaching, of transmitting compassion. It can barely be retained. That is the feel of the teaching I. 
That is the feel of your actual hold on what you call compassion. Hey, 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 Tantra Mother sees and knows your deficiencies far better than you do. First, she teaches you the true nature of the hold you have on compassion, the way you hold it in order to dispense it. Tantra Mother does not show you the teaching eye in the hand gesture such as Avalokiteshvara does as she looks down as if in imitation of that Bodhisattva. No, no. You are the one who looks down. You look down into yourself for self-love. She looks right through you, dissolving the veils of pretending and confers on you the teaching I. She gently steadies your hand and guides you to the correct concepts and emotions that allow you to show genuine compassion, if that is your real intent. Now to assist her, Mother Kali, the frequency of band one of the Shakti cluster, exercises the play of her destructive power. You know, Kali has a bad reputation. The destroyer, she destroys. But what actually does Kali destroy? Well, Kali destroys illusions, especially the illusion of compassion. She exercises the play of her destructive power delightfully upon all illusions, but first and foremost, the illusion of compassion. Kalima whispers her instruction in twilight talk. Sanja Basa, twilight talk that goes directly to the ears of the magical children of the wisdom goddess. Be ruthless in self love. Same tasting, meaning it tastes the same. The moment for closure of the Buddha Dharma has come as of July 1st, 2019, if I may be so bold, to announce the date of the Dragonfly Sutra. Now you and PT have the opportunity to participate in this event and even to take part in making it happen, if that is your disposition. Disposition is the mother of intent. If it is not, no problem, no fault. Closure entails scenes in the film of the all real, real, in which you are not on camera. You are not scripted there due to your own intent based on your disposition. But you are still in that movie. You can begin the Gayan Tantric practice of self-love by a kind of rehearsal. Keep repeating certain lines that belong to you in the script of the alt-real, real. You write the lines yourself. You script yourself into the film, the director's cut. You script yourself into correction. If you Win the role, all you got to do is play the part. The world goes its way to insanity and oblivion and enters the fifth reel, which you might compare to the fifth son of the Aztecs, or then again you might not. The extras all go with it. You remain, you star in your role, to play your lines correctly, you rehearse them like any actor does. 
tell yourself honestly that you do not pretend anymore to feel compassion for anyone, not a single individual or humanity as a whole, and you do not even feel some compassion in exceptional cases for others known to you in what you regard as a familiar or intimate way, admitting that, you also admit that you don't know how to act on it. Act on what you suppose you might feel. Stop pretending you can act on it in the correct way. That is, authentically. Give it up. Let it go. And render the sum total of what you hold to be compassion into self-love. And then ask this question. Why do I love myself so much? Eh? Well, you can leave out the so much. Why do I love myself? Hey, the answer is the same for everyone, but not everyone in the world. Everyone who engages in correction along these lines, yes. Anyone else? Nope. Accepting and observing these parameters is required of you to join the class of selection. The answer is the same for everyone in that class, but only a bodhisattva can know it and pronounce it. You love yourself for being a magical child of the wisdom goddess, don't you? For being a selfless emanation of the radiant wisdom stream of the Aeonic Mother. You do not and cannot love yourself for no reason at all. To do so is perverse. It is nothing but cheap narcissism. And more. You love yourself in the awakening of your accomplishments. This event is open-ended, lavish, wild and elegant, sensuous beyond all measure, unpredictable and inexhaustible. Live from the accomplishments held in co-emergent beauty with your source, who is none other than Mother Earth, and you cannot become anything but more beautiful. Now, this practice comes under the genre of Gayan Tantra. And that being so, face it, it introduces the concept of self-love, which is outstanding and exceptional, unlike anything that has ever been proposed using that term. And I will remind you of that point at the conclusion of this talk by referring to the very great and obvious fact that there is not one single instruction on self-love in the entire body of Buddhist teachings, be it Hinayana, Mahayana, or Vajrayana. Now, after all, what does Gayantantra connote? Coupling, that is, tantric union, with the power source. Gaya or Gaya Sophia. Every ritual and even every thought and sensation you undergo in planetary tantra arises from the dynamic of that coupling. The co dynamic of tantra is totally pervasive in life and in psyche alike. The actual field of experience where you act from your accomplishments, note that phrase, has been called in Buddhist jargon, well, a number of things, but it has been described by the adjective co-emergent. It has also been designated by the word samarasa, same tasting. The way your self-love tastes to you 
is exactly how it tastes to your aeonic mother, Sophia. She tastes it as you do. Through your self-love, she has and holds and keeps your taste in the register of her vital texture. The register of the vital texture of her body. These vital textures are like stains and they are in reality stains. The Ionic Mother keeps track of individual human creatures such as myself and yourself in two ways that I can describe right now. I'll mention two and describe one. How do you like that? One way is acoustically and the other way is by tracking stains which are like the colored lines that appear in the analysis of DNA. Picture it. You can also picture the stained paper strip used in chemical analysis, the so-called SDS page, that records the chemical composition and concentration in polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. The truck just went down the road and the windows open. So I'll repeat that. Polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. SDS itself stands for sodium dodexo sulfate, which is a gel used in electrophoresis. And by the way, you are in electrophoresis. In case you don't know it by now, I brought up that point in the unit on the pretense of compassion. Sophia knows you individually, intimately. Oh, yes, she does. By a stain she tracks in her equivalent to the Book of Life, which is composed of something like SDS pages, a weave of them actually. One second of her time is 108 days of your lived experience. Indeed, 108 days of the entirety of the lived experience of everything that lives in the biosphere of the earth, including the activity of the ocean, the clouds, the rivers, microbial behavior, anaerobic behavior, on the soil, under the soil. Now, I'm sure you've seen a rush of clouds streaming in a film played on high speed. Imagine the total rush of 108 days of terrestrial life passing in one second. It looks like a huge blur. A mosaic blur, to be exact. It's a huge blur composed of exquisite and granular mosaic detail. In that blur, the aeonic mother picks you out by a stain that streaks through the material wave of her dreaming. She can identify you in that way. Yes, you, the single mortal human creature. Every single one of us. The identification is precarious, however. It needs to be fixed. 
like a photographic image is fixed by bathing it in the pan of chemical solution in the darkroom, the developer. For Sophia, that chemical developer is your self-love a bodily attribute you hold in the same way you hold a basal metabolic rate. Everything is material. Your self-love fixes you in her field of attention and makes it easier for her to find you and track you closely. It actually allows her to taste you. What I'm going to say now, I've recounted before. What I'm going to say now will be recorded in severed rows. In telestic session, the organic light will approach the witness and upon physical contact, it will taste that animal. It will lick, it does lick, I stand corrected. <laughs> it does lick your entire body, producing the delicious sensation of cool melon on your skin and especially on your face. When Sophia tastes you in this way and likes your particular taste so that she reseeks it, now that she has an appetite for it, she shows you her pleasure by giving you one perfectly clear drop of mucus, usually from the right nostril, but sometimes from the left. One single intact drop, like a liquid diamond. I'm happy to say that I am not alone in having had that experience. Mama teach. Okay, if you want an image to put on the fridge, use this one. It shows the relaxed lion seat posture of the Bodhisattva, which is distinguished, which you can distinguish from the full lotus posture of the Buddha, or various representations of enlightened ones, and which you can also distinguish from the Yab-Yum, or the sacred Maithuna, or sexual congress in Tantra, of any particular deity and consort. The lion sea posture is relaxed, with one leg down off the seat and the teaching eye in the right palm so that the hand is extended down toward that leg. There it is. It's a lovely variation you may perhaps not have known before if you've ever had the occasion to look over the thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of variations of images of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in different postures, lakshanas. Remember that the Prajna Paramita canon comprises those sutras in the genre of paramount wisdom that provided the basis for establishing Mahayana Buddhism around 200 CE and subsequently came to be regarded as the signature teachings of that movement called the Great Vehicle, or sometimes the Middle Vehicle, standing between Hinayana and Vajrayana. Now, in Planetary Tantra, Tantra Mother is not only the rendering of Avelokiteshvara, but also of the Prajnaparamita. You can count on that. She, the Prajnaparamita, Sophia figure, who was, in fact, identical in its time, to the Sophia of the Gnostics, and then some. I've recounted the teachings and techniques specific to Tantra Mother and to her frequency off and on and here and there. Most 
lately, I did it in the pretense of compassion. And here I reproduce that inventory. Specialities of Tantra Mother, a.k.a. Vajrayogini, a.k.a. Dorje Fagmo, a.k.a. Miss Piggy. It's not over until Miss Piggy sings. Release from pretending. Ay, caramba. Instruction of the Five Skull Crown Initiation. Super Saturation. Sutaka, the city of rendering, which is also attributed to another Devata. Match and Merge, which is the Gayan Tantric equivalent to the development and perfection stages of Atta Yoga, reputed to be and claimed to be the highest Tibetan Tantra. Well, that's a snatch. That's a snatch for the Maitreya. That's an easy snatch. That's an easy piece of pleasure. Certain tantric sexual practices which are expounded and released with Mahakali. Sophianic baby talk, you may recall that from um, Mandela Effect Decoded. It refers to the configuration of the pre-verbal neuronal circuits. The meta-theme of the six worlds, which is the teaching of Avelokiteshvara, and the rendering of the Prajna Paramita, which I call the Mahayana Makeover. Now, let's look closely at the last item. And then picture someone holding out a hand of cards and dealing them to you from the hand. All right, I shift here into a gaming metaphor. Some of you engaged in PT, who followed the g &E perhaps, will know that the gaming metaphor is a Kalika technique to master any and every situation. Any situation, any challenge, any test, any difficulty, any problem that can be converted into a gaming metaphor can be surmounted immediately. So, picture someone holding out a hand of cards and dealing those cards to you from the hand. Now, this is an odd way to deal cards, no doubt. Usually, the dealer, and you see one pictured here, lays them out on the playing deck, on the table. In this case, picture the dealer dispensing the cards directly from her hand to yours. The more cards she deals, the more cards she has to deal. <laughs> Picture the multiplication of a thousand arms of Avelokiteshvara as a blurring gesture of dealing cards in a blurring gesture of a thousand hands dealing cards. Each time Tantra Mother dispenses one card from her hand, you receive more than one. Dealing from her hand, that is, from her actual hand and from the hand, the selection of cards she holds. She double deals into your hand, into your mind. That is how Tantra Mother herself uses the hands that hold her endless array of teaching eyes. Those eyes are rendered into cards she deals. How wild is that? Tantra Mother deals the cards directly from her hand to yours. Now look again at the last item in the list of her specialties. Mahayana Makeover. Now, commencing 
in the shift of Tantra Mother of 2019, that Devada deals every single element of Mahayana doctrine rendered in expressions into the content of planetary tantra that you find here on Nemata and in my writings and words. In their rendered form, the Mahayana principles and practices are user-friendly and pool simple. That's a Zen reference. They work in direct application, immediate lucidity, playfully. And if you don't have that experience, by the way, I'm ready, willing, and able soon enough to tell you why not. It's no big problem. Don't sweat it. Don't worry. And don't ever, ever fault yourself or put yourself down. Ever. Tantra Mother plays with the magical children of the wisdom goddess, like a mother playing and cooing with her child in arms. Only she has thousands of arms. This play is sublime instruction of blazing dexterity and variety and cannot be either equaled or excelled. You, you, oh, you, in planetary time today, stand in the direct path of reception to an outpouring of benevolent generosity on a scale you cannot imagine and could never have wished to receive. But through self-love, you do receive it. The elements in the Mahayana makeover are all child-friendly and child-safe. You cannot hurt yourself doing anything in Planetary Tantra, and you cannot hurt yourself by failing or appearing to fail. First, you learn to count to six. Figure that. Do you think you're up for that? Do you think you can learn to count to six? In the Mahayana makeover? Your education is simple and full of delight. It's, an, it's a delight to both learn it and teach it. I'm learning this educational program of Mahayana rendered myself right now. And I teach it as I learn it, you see. Begins, I begin... It begins. What's the difference between I and it? What's the difference between you and it? Begins at the highest, most advanced level of enlightenment attainable on this planet and holds there, there it hovers like a hummingbird. For example... The instruction on the number two, two follows one, I'm not telling you what one is, that goes to the Dragonfly Sutra. But the instruction, just to give an example, because I'm not going to go into it, because it's too much for one time, isn't it? The instruction of the number two is perception and reflection are two sides of the same koan. Now that is the totality of the instruction. I swear. And the fun continues. When you reach six, you receive the six paramitas rendered as if a set of teeth grows over your existing teeth. You feel the parameters in your mind like teeth in your mouth. One offering. You notice I did not say one offering. Go back, replay, repeat. One offering. One offering. 
get it. I will not push the length of this unit spoken and written to the level of overload I, I probably already have. It's a bad habit of mine. But one more point of insight needs to be made crystal clear. Now return your attention to the topic of self-love and hold it there. Breathe deeply. Beginners who encounter PT and coming soon, Sophianic animism, which is PT light for the masses, naturally bring up some predictable questions. One of which is, do you make offerings to the wisdom goddess? Well, that's a normal, perfectly normal question to ask, isn't it? Notice, by the way, that the talk that follows has no corresponding text in this unit. I closed the window, too. The window to the loft, looking out on the fields of Flanders, where there is a glorious crop of linen currently blooming. So, yeah, it's a completely normal question. Tads all around the world, whatever culture, whatever country, have had some conditioning of religion, some religious conditioning, religious entrainment. Well, what is one of the fundamental practices of a religion? It's to make offerings to the God the divine being, the deity, observed in that religion. This is true of, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, you know, any religion you can think of, any indigenous religion, any large-scale globalist religion, involves in one way or another the presentation of offerings, doesn't it? So, what about offerings to the wisdom goddess? What about offerings to the devadas of the Shakti cluster? Do you make offerings to them? Is it a fundamental practice of planetary tantra to make ritual offerings to the Aeon Sophia, your Divine Mother. It's perfectly natural and normal to ask that question. Now in response, I will respond with a question before I respond with an answer. And my question in response to that question is, Well, how can you offer anything to a power that gives you everything? How can you possibly offer anything to the divine mother power that offers you everything, offers and gives you everything? She gives you your eyelashes your fingernails, the polypeptides in your tummy. She gives you your mind and allows you to take it and use it as if it were your own. She gives you the earth and the sky. She gives you the mountains and the sea. I defy you to name anything that she does not offer you. You can't. So how on earth can you offer anything to her? I really, really wish that you would stop for a moment and reflect on that question.
How can you offer anything to the hostess with the mostess? Well, what you can offer her would have to be something that she can't offer you. And what could that be? Is there anything that the Aeon Sophia, your Divine Mother, who is materially imminent in the planet Earth and the natural environment where you live and breathe, is there anything that she cannot offer you, anything that can only come from you by offering it to yourself? Yes, there is. And you know what it is, don't you? I don't even have to say it, do I? I don't have to say it. I could stop right now. I could shut the F up right now and turn off the recorder. I don't have to tell you what you can offer yourself that the Aeonic Mother cannot offer you. But it is my great privilege to tell you that once you offer it to yourself, you can turn around and offer it to her. And that is the one offering that she supremely wants to see. When you stand in a field by the river, when you stand in the mountains or on the plain, and you stand anywhere in the presence of nature, and you look at the natural setting around you, knowing that it is the imminent expression of her presence, it is her planetary body, and knowing that, and you say to it, I am Rome. And so I love myself, knowing that I am a magical child of the wisdom goddess. Your act of self-recognition inherent to offering self-love to yourself is the one offering you can make to her and the only one you ever need to make and the only one she ever needs to receive. And that is such. <laughs>